Hello there, and welcome back to 60 Years of the Space Age, a Malaysian internet podcast series on science epic that attempts to retell the story of humanity's march into outer space from the days of Sputnik in 1957 to what's going on today in 2017. From the space race to SpaceX, I'd like to say, I'm your host and guide through the wide open skies and beyond as we embark on this journey together on Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age. Right, welcome to part 8 of our retelling of the story of mankind's journey to the stars. In the last entry in this series, part 7, we celebrated and talked about the very moment of the Sputnik launch by describing some of the details of that night of October 4th, 1957, the night humanity truly stepped into the space age. In part 7, we talked about what it might have felt like to have been there at Baikonur Cosmodrome, what it might have looked like to look up at the sky as Sputnik took off into the heavens. But what happened after that? What happened to the world following the launch of Sputnik? For something so small an object as Sputnik, and it was pretty small, about the size of your average beach ball, the launch of Sputnik by the Soviet Union in 1957 really caused quite a big stir in the West. The response and shock that trailed the launch was really unexpected, especially the reaction from the average Joe public, the normal citizens of the United States. Everyone had realized that with the launch, the truly impossible had been achieved. Humans had gone to space at a time when, 10 years before that moment, such a thing was considered impossible, an unthinkable thing of dreams. And although at that time in 1957, a human being had yet to travel in the same way that Sputnik had, it was only a matter of time before it actually happened. A world of infinite possibilities, or should I say, a universe of infinite possibilities, had been opened for humanity, and a race would begin to see who could tap into its potential better, the United States of America or the Soviet Union, if America could actually get to space in the first place. But anyway, the launch of Sputnik would immediately trigger a great panic known as the Sputnik Crisis. And that's where I get the title of today's episode from, Panic at the Get-Go. It's a play on words on the name of a band that I used to listen to in high school called Panic at the Disco. They played a brand of emo rock and roll music. But yeah, instead of Panic at the Disco, it was more like Panic at the Get-Go, which refers to the beginning of something. At the very beginning of the space age, the very get-go of the space age, there was Sputnik. And then there was Panic. So we begin this story arc, now alternating to the other side of the globe, to the United States of America. For the past few entries into this series, 60 Years of the Space Age, we've mainly focused on the endeavors of the Soviet Union, and rightfully so. They were the ones pushing hard on the space frontier, with chief designer Sergei Korolev steadily driving the development of the R-7 rockets, and then using those rockets to get Sputnik into low Earth orbit in early October of 1957. But that's not to say that America did not have its own heavyweight contender of its own that would be able to respond to this. They did. They had the Werner von Braun, a German rocket scientist formerly under the employ of the Nazis during World War II. 
It was Von Braun that had designed the V-2 rockets that Korolev's R-7s were actually based on. So you could imagine Von Braun be swagging like, I see what you're trying to do, it ain't even nothing new, that's the shiz I've been on, been on, been on, yeah. But there was a problem though at the time in the 50s up until 1957. America was in this state of arrogance in regard to its status in the world. Carl Sagan liked to use the word hubris. Hubris in its own ability and status in the world. They had emerged from the Second World War as the dominant world power, a position which was reinforced by their belief in their unrivaled level of their technology, their military, and their economy. So the mood at the time, in the 50s, was pretty much America fuck yeah. It existed in spades even more than what we have today. Back then, it was far more evident. America was, as General Aladdin put it, number one. Aladdin, motherfucker. And this arrogance was what prevented America from putting their vast resources and weight behind the issue of tackling space. They kept Von Braun, probably one of their greatest assets in the space race sidelined for the most part, as if they were not even interested in him. Some of this came from the feeling of, some of this resentment came from the feeling of unwillingness to collaborate with the former Nazi. And their first real attempt at going, the, Ameri the first real attempt the Americans made at going into space, called Project Vanguard, actually ended up blowing up in their face. <laughs> Splat. Which was no fault on Von Braun's part. More on that later. But the Americans were about to get a rude awakening from that state of prideful dreaming, and the Sputnik launch was the event that woke the nation. Following Sputnik, the once proud America panicked. Previously, they had thought that they had the upper hand over the Soviet Union and that the technological divide between the two countries was far in favor of the U.S. It turns out at the time that the Soviets were producing more scientists and engineers per year than the United States, and apparently with even better leadership in science too, despite America thinking that they were inferior since they were pretty much an authoritarian, totalitarian, SJW-controlled evil empire dictatorship with no freedom, let alone the capability and willingness to achieve such a great technological feat as sending a satellite into space. Oh, how the mighty had fallen. They had gravely misunderestimated their enemy. The Sputnik launch made them realize that they were behind, gave them the feeling that they were behind, and being behind had its consequences. I've been talking about in the previous installations, in, I've been talking about in the previous installments of this podcast that the Sputnik launch really had nothing to do with actually exploring space. And that wasn't really the main goal. Well, to the scientists and engineers that built the rocket, like Sergei Korolev and Fl Valentin Glushko, that might have been the reasoning behind it. That's the reason why they wanted to do it. But to the Soviet leadership, Morty, it was more about closing the gap in technology with America and showing America that Mother Russia was not to be messed with. Da? Da, you want to mess with me? I spit hot borscht when I'm crushing these beats. What Sputnik showed America in particular was that Soviet Russia was able to do two very scary things and that are Number one, send a satellite into space, something that had never been done before in a frontier that had previously been unexplored, untapped, and unrealized. The mysterious abyss. Space was this mysterious, unaccessible frontier, and the Soviet Union was the first one there. The world had no idea what the USSR could do next with access to space. They could have filled it with weapons of unimaginable power, and then held the entire world hostage, which was probably along the lines of which the Americans were thinking at the time. And the second thing that Sputnik demonstrated was the undeniable distance capabilities 
of the Soviet Union's missiles, their rockets. Suddenly, the Soviet menace appeared, seemed all the more menacing. Imagine North Korea, but with times 10 in missile capability. That's how scary it was. America, that had once thought itself isolated and untouchable from any sort of threat originating from the European continent due to the great Pacific and Atlantic oceans, now finally had something to be legitimately afraid of. The unprecedented reach of Soviet R-7 missiles. The same missiles that sent Sputnik to the stars. In fact, when Sputnik was deorbited, it came crashing back down to Earth in January, several months after its launch. It landed at some sleepy side street in Wisconsin, in the Midwest of America, like some sort of last parting kiss as the, of the impact of Sputnik. So obviously, if another country, let alone an evil empire dictatorship, were able to do that with their apparently superior brand of technology, there was something to freak out about. <laughs> yeah. There are these moments in history that really reverberate with the type of public outcry that it receives. What I mean is like, you know, when you have something that happens and your heart kind of sinks with the weight of the event, and that type of feeling is synonymous with what you feel every time you think back to that moment. Like breakups are synonymous with sadness and birthdays are synonymous with happiness. You can liken the feeling of what Sputnik caused in America similar to the aftermath of the September 11 attacks on the World Trade Center in recent memory and how people reacted following that event, the common reactions being mass hysteria and panic. Panic at the get-go following Sputnik would be similar to that. Of course, Twitter didn't exist back then and they didn't have the same type of TV news network like CNN, so you wouldn't see 24-7 news coverage on anything like that, but essentially the entirety of the American public was engulfed in this mass hysteria and panic, and just like 9-11, the public opinion in America was that there would forever be two different worlds, two different time periods in history, pre-Sputnik and post-Sputnik, just like pre-9-11 and post-9-11. The following and following that reaction is essentially how the world would change with the American response to Sputnik 60 years ago. That was where it all began. There was actually a reception going on at the Soviet embassy in Washington around the time of the night of the Sputnik launch. At first glance, it was nothing too out of the ordinary. The two parties from the two different countries were gathering to discuss matters of science. And of course, during the time of the Cold War, there were the usual rounds of one-upmanship and dick measuring between the Americans and the Soviets. This meeting was happening in conjunction with the IGY, International Geophysical Year, that I mentioned two podcasts ago in the Trigger to the Sky episode, a collaboration initiative to share science between East and West following the death of Joseph Stalin. You had the American scientists and the Soviet scientists mingling amongst each other, just chilling and talking science and whatnot, when suddenly one of the members of the IGY committee, this guy named Lloyd Berkner, silenced the room to announce something. I've just been informed by the New York Times that a Russian satellite is in orbit at an elevation of 900 kilometers. I wish to congratulate our Soviet colleagues on their achievement. Sort of like a drops the mic moment, isn't it? The faces of the American scientists turned pale, champagne glasses were dropped, and jaws hit the proverbial floor. The Russians had dropped the bomb. Well, not literally, but it definitely felt like it. The shockwave reverberating throughout the embassy and the rest of the nation. Were they really the greatest nation on earth, as their leaders had so boisterously declared at the time? Were they really the leaders of the world as their technology and their capitalist ideology allowed them to be? Was it really America the bold or were they now to play second fiddle in the world stage of nations? 
These were the questions that beset the American leadership and the American people following that night of October 4th. Later that night, the scientists would adjourn to the rooftop of the embassy to look at the heavens, the Soviet scientists having conducted a successful propaganda gambit with the launch of their satellite. Gleamed with pride at the night sky, knowing that on that night it belonged to them, while the Americans looked up and saw a future of uncertainty. It was only the beginning. The reason that the Sputnik event penetrated deep into the soul of America was that America perceived itself as not just the champion of freedom and liberty, but also as a nation at the forefront of progress technologically. America was home to the likes of Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, Henry Ford, automobile industrialist, and the Manhattan Project that split the atom. This reinforced the belief among Americans that their nation was the technological giant of the world. The Soviet success with the first Sputnik, and there would be more, questioned American technological brilliance. And that also, in a way, questioned America's capability in all those other areas. Setbacks in the arena of space, an arena so very much synonymous with the exploratory nature of mankind, really added more insult to injury. The spirit of America as a nation was that founded on the values of exploration, and to have the Soviets beat them into space really shook the nation to its foundational core. And oh my god, those commie bastards could like literally bomb us with nukes anytime they wanted. The American response would be great, but unconcentrated at first. Just like during the Second World War, America generally enters things unprepared and then adapts to become an absolute beast. America would reply with an ill-fated naval research laboratory rocket called Vanguard TV-3 that crashed back to the launch pad on December 6, 1957. The media was quick to call it Kaputnik. Oh, more like Stay Putnik. Oh, snap. Or, or, or how about Flopnik? Ooh, savage. So President Eisenhower unapologetically turned to Werner von Braun, who was at the time tasked with building medium-range missiles for the Redstone Arsenal in Alabama. And von Braun was like, nigga, please, I got this. And eight weeks later, on January 31st, 1958, America was in space with its own satellite, Explorer 1. The panic of the public, not nearly at rest, but channeled into new initiatives and new ideas that would chariot America and the rest of the world into a new age. But that's a story for the next installment here on 60 Years of the Space Age. If you enjoy this type of work and wish to see it continue, support us by donating to us on Patreon and I will be truly grateful. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.